Good afternoon, everyone. It's my pleasure to introduce our final speaker for this afternoon. Uh, Dr. Gleb, who was kind enough not to ask me to pronounce his last name, was lauded as the office whisperer and hybrid expert by the New York Times for helping leaders uh, use hybrid work to improve retention and productivity while cutting costs. He serves as the CEO of the Future of Work consulting firm, Disaster Avoidance Experts, and he wrote seven best-selling books, including Returning to the Office and Leading Hybrid and Remote Teams. He's published over 650 articles in prominent venues, such as Harvard Business Review, Forbes, and Fortune. His cutting-edge thought leadership was translated into Chinese, German, Russian, Korean, Polish, Spanish, Vietnamese, French, and other languages, if there are others. Um, Dr. Gleb, Gleb's expertise comes from over 20 years of consulting and training. His clients include Fortune 500 companies ranging from Aflax to Xerox. His expertise also comes from his academic background as a behavioral scientist. Dr. Gleb taught for eight years as a lecturer at UNC Chapel Hill and, has, and seven years as a professor at Ohio State. Dr. Gleb is a proud Ukrainian American and lives in Columbus, Ohio. And in his free time, he spends abundant quality time with his wife to avoid his personal life turning into a disaster. <laughs> oh, thanks. It's said to wait for laughs, so I got a few. That's nice. Um, so to help take advantage of his groundbreaking ex expertise, we've asked him to speak about mastering the balance sheet of employee and client engagement through behavioral science. So please give a big round of applause and welcome Dr. Gleb. Thank you very much. All right, everyone. So welcome to this final speech of the day. And we'll talk about employee engagement. We'll talk about client engagement using behavioral science research. That's going to be the focus of the presentation. That's what you can expect. The first part, we'll talk about some of the challenges with client engagement, with employee engagement, and of course, about the concept of engagement in general. And then the second part, we'll talk about some best practices to actually fix these problems. So that's what you can anticipate from the shape of the presentation. That's what it will be about. OK. Now, I want to share with you by starting with Bruce Zuccari. So this is Bruce Zuccari. He is the CEO of the Bonadio Group, which is a top 50 accounting firm. And I interviewed him in preparation for this talk and a few others. But I think he has the best message to convey about employee engagement in particular. So let's check out what Bruce wanted to share with you. Now, I know you're really concerned about culture and strategies to improve culture in the Bonadio Group. So tell me a little bit about why you think culture is so important. You know, to us, uh, culture is our secret sauce. Uh, that more than anything is why this firm, I believe, is why this firm has grown, uh, why we've been successful. Um, we've been uh, really rooted in upstate New York, which has been an environment that has not grown at all over, over the 40 plus years of the firm's existence. But the firm has grown from you know, a startup firm to a, a top 50 firm in the country. And, mm. I th and, and I really believe in a large part that's due to it's our people, our most important asset, and our culture. So Bruce thinks that people and culture are the most crucial asset of his firm. And that's why they were able to grow to the size that they are right now, a top 50 accounting firm. They've been very successful, even though their local market hasn't grown. They've expanded, they have a presence in Arizona, their presence everywhere or across the country. So this is key to realize, to think about. It's going to be people, the engagement component is going to be critically dependent on having a good culture and really understanding people, understanding how they feel, connecting with them, resonating with them. That's what culture is about. That's what engagement is about. So when you think about the concept of engagement, really understanding what is important to people. Unfortunately, we've been seeing that increasingly engagement is in trouble here in the United States. So Gallup data, recent Gallup data shows that engagement has been dropping, unfortunately. It actually rose early on in the pandemic, but it has been dropping as we have the returns to office and as there have been a lot of conflicts around the returns to office. It's an area I work on a lot 
And that has been a, a real challenge for employee engagement. So a lot of companies are struggling. This is a big area of challenge. And so what you want to realize is that this is something that employees have been, employers have been trying to address, but despite that, employee engagement has been going down. So the first part of the presentation, like I said, is the obstacles. What are the obstacles? What are the challenges with employee engagement? And the second part will be about solving these problems. So that's what the presentation will be about. That's what you can expect. So first we'll discuss the obstacles, then how to overcome them. But that's the broader context. What you want to do is get to the level of where the Bonadia group is, or maybe even further, and understand that people, culture, are going to be fundamentally important to solve the challenges of engagement, employee engagement, and client engagement, because that's how the Bonadia group got ahead as well. Their client engagement has been excellent because of their people, because of their culture. Okay, now I want to get to something that a number of you might have thought when I started speaking, not when you first saw me, but when I started speaking. Where are you from? A lot of people like to know that. I obviously have an accent, so I'll be happy to tell you where I'm from. I'm from, my dad is Ukrainian and my mom is Moldovan. And unfortunately, Ukraine is well known by now, very unfortunately, still have family there. And my mom is in Moldova, which is to the southwest of Ukraine, a small country. So small, you need an arrow to point to it to show where it is. My dad moved to Moldova, he met my mom, that's where I was born in 1981. And then when Moldova, and I lived in Ukraine for some time in Moldova, mostly Moldova, when Moldova was freed from Soviet Russian domination in 1991, my parents moved to the United States. So I moved to the United States, that's where I grew up, in New York City, that's kind of my hometown. And if you know anything about New York, you know it's a cultural melting pot, it's a metropolis. Very diverse. You walk a block, you hear a dozen different accents. And so I didn't really feel pressured to change my accent, drop my accent. Right now I live in Columbus, Ohio, which is not nearly as diverse. So <laughs> if I moved to Columbus in the first place, I probably would have worked to drop my accent. But my parents taught me to be proud of my cultural heritage. It didn't seem like a problem for me. So I didn't work on dropping my accent. Unfortunately, I found out later that's kind of a dumb decision because of a tendency called accent discrimination. That's when I went to UNC Pe for Chapel Hill for my PhD, I learned about this topic. So there's, unfortunately, a tendency among Americans, all sorts, I'm not saying you, <laughs> but Americans more broadly, to perceive those with different accents as not trustworthy. It's a false perception, it's important to address this perception, but it's real, that's kind of how it is. That's how people perceive those with foreign accents. There's only one foreign accent to which this doesn't really apply. Anyone want to guess what this is? Yes, the English accent. They still have that cultural imperialism going for them. <laughs> so, what's going on here? Well, we have to realize that it's the consequence of how our minds are wired. And there are two specific ways that our minds are miswired that I want to share with you about that have to do with the horns effect and the halo effect the horns effect and the halo effect. So the horns effect has to do with someone having little horns in their head. If someone has a characteristic that is something you don't like, and something that feels intuitively off-putting, something that feels like they're not part of your tribe, then you'll tend to have too negative view of all of their other characteristics. So that's the horns effect. The halo effect is the opposite. It's kind of somebody like has a little halo on their heads. If they have a characteristic that you like, then you will tend to trust them too much. They'll seem like really a part of your tribe. And so that's a real problem. That can be a real challenge in all sorts of business situations, professional situations. So think about, let's say, within a company. If you're an internal accountant within a company, you can have halo effect toward your fellow accountants, but you might have conflicts with other departments that, let's say, operations or sales, those will be horns effects. So that's going to be a challenge. Or let's say you are working in an accounting firm and you have halo effect, of course, toward your colleagues, but if you're performing an audit on another company, then you might have horns effects, relationships, well, they will have horns effects toward you. <laughs> 
So that's kind of dynamic that goes on. I've seen pretty often with accounting firms that I work with, that I talk to. Another challenge, of course, is in hiring. Hiring, promotion, evaluation, you have a lot of horns effects. And I want to share with you about an example. So this is from a presentation I gave to over 100 HR professionals at a keynote, closing keynote in Columbus, Ohio, where I live. Now, if you know anything about Columbus, Ohio, it's the home of the Ohio State Buckeyes. We're doing pretty well this year. Hopefully, we'll beat Michigan, and they're sign stealers anyway. <laughs> now, last year, we didn't beat them, but you know, clearly, there's an explanation now. <laughs> and so I was giving this keynote presentation. So again, there's over 100 HR leaders in the room from large companies like Nationwide and so on, Grange Insurance, plenty of companies that are pretty sizable. It's a diversity, equity, inclusion conference, and I'm asking them whether they will hire a University of Michigan fan. So let's see what they have to say. So, as you know, I'm a professor at Ohio State. I'm contractually obligated to root for the Buckeyes. <laughs> I'm guessing there are a lot of Buckeyes fans here, you know. Go Bucks, right? Yo, oh, there you go. Now, how likely are you to hire a Michigan fan? See, free people. Now, regardless of how we feel about Michigan fans and their poor, poor choices, <laughs> in which team to root for, does that indicate anything about their performance as an employee? No, I know. Come on, that no should be stronger. <laughs> now, there were over 100 people in that room, so more people than there were here and only three of them would hire a Michigan fan. And I gave them a chance to change their mind. It's not their intuitive, visceral reaction. And you heard that they weren't willing to change their mind. <laughs> so if you think about this, obviously if I asked them about a protected core category, ethnicity, race, gender, sexuality, ability, and so on, they would not have had this reaction. They're kind of thinking about this. But the, obviously rooting for a football team is not a protected category. <laughs> So if you're not watching out for halo effect or horns effect in a specific area, you're going to fall for it. I mean, these are HR leaders. You're not mo the large majority of you are not HR leaders. They're specifically there to diversity, equity, inclusion conference, and they all fell for it, except three people. So I want you to really think about and just take 30 seconds, write down where the horns effect and the halo effect might be playing a negative role in your organization. So let's take 30 seconds, write down and identify where these might be problems in your organization. Please go ahead. All right, let's go on and think about the broader context here. The crucial thing that you need to think about when you're thinking about employee engagement and these cognitive biases, these dangerous judgment errors, we talk about cognitive biases, the halo effect and horns effect are two examples of the dangerous judgment errors that come from how our mind is wired. You need to be aware of emotional intelligence and social intelligence in order to address them and have effective employee and client engagement. So emotional intelligence. You probably heard this concept, it's quite common. Now, the two core aspects, the two core skill areas of emotional intelligence are awareness of your emotions, of how you feel, and management of your emotions. So I'm thinking about, oh, 
I have a negative reaction toward this person, the horns effect. You need to be aware that that's happening, and you also need to be able to catch that and tamp it down, as an example. Well, the same thing with halo effect. You know, if I asked them about hiring a Buckeyes fan, they would have been much like, more likely to hire this person than that person deserved. So same thing, same idea. You need to be aware of and be able to catch that. And when you're thinking about how do you relate to others, that's social intelligence. Being aware of their relationship to you, your relationship to them, and being able to influence the relationships between yourself and others, people. So that's what social intelligence is about. And for effective employee engagement, client engagement, you need to do both. You need to have skill sets in both. So that's what you really want to be thinking about, both emotional intelligence and social intelligence. Emotional intelligence, of course, comes first, first self-knowledge and self-management, and then other knowledge and other management. Now, the reason it's hard for us to have good instincts in the modern world, why we have that halo effect and horns effect, why we have trouble with emotional intelligence and social intelligence, is because our minds are not wired for the modern environment. Unfortunately, we are wired to live in small tribes of 50 people to 150 people in that evolutionary environment. So that's where our ancestors survived due to the fight or flight response and strong tribalism. So that's what our ancestors really responded to. Now, the fight or flight response, you might have heard of this as the saber-toothed tiger response. It was more important for our survival to jump at 100 shadows than to miss one saber-toothed tiger. <laughs> we're the descendants of those who jumped at a hundred shadows and weren't eaten by the tiger. Same thing for tribalism. We needed to be very tribal in order to not be kicked out of our tribe, otherwise we'd die. So that's the halo effect. And we need to be hostile toward those in other tribes, otherwise they take our tribe over and we die. And that's the horns effect and other cognitive biases that are related to that. So that's tribalism. Now, unfortunately, gut reactions that were a good fit for that savanna environment, it was good for our survival to be tribal, they're not so good for the modern world because we work with people who are very different from us. Obviously, we don't just live in people who are small tribes of 50 people. That's not what we do in the modern world. We need to really function well with people who are different from us and overcome any halo effects and horns effects we have toward them. So going with your gut is pretty dangerous. You might have heard you know, people saying, gurus saying, go with your gut, trust your heart, follow your intuitions. That is not helpful <laughs> if you want to make good decisions about people in the modern world, because we will have tendencies, problematic tendencies, around the halo effect and the horns effect. So sometimes your gut will be right, sometimes it will be wrong, but you should never simply trust it. You should always check with your head if you have more than a few seconds to make a better decision. Now, gut reaction is a fuzzy concept, and some of you might be wondering, well, why can't I trust my gut? So your gut, again, can sometimes be right. It can sometimes be wrong. And the key here is that gut reaction is a broad category. It might apply to dangerous intuitive and primal instincts that have to do with, the, with tribalism, with the fight or flight response, quick decision making that's not going to get you in the right direction. And it might have to do with healthy, learned, civilized behaviors, patterns of behavior that are going to be functional, that are going to be beneficial, that are going to serve you well. And you can't tell intuitively which one it is. That's the danger. Because sometimes your gut will feel right, and sometimes it will, it will be right. It will always feel right. Sometimes it will be right, and sometimes it will not be right. So you want to learn where you have expert intuition. So expert intuition is the area where you have a great deal of practice. So think about areas where you have a great deal of practice, where you had many opportunities to learn to make quick decisions, get quick feedback on your decision, and then have a chance to make better decisions. So that's expert intuition. You might have heard of you know, 10,000 hours rule. All of these concepts have to do with expertise, areas where you picked up expertise over time where, again, you have a lot of chances to make decisions, get quick feedback on your decisions, and make new decisions in that same area. Now, you might have expert intuition 
as an accountant, looking at spreadsheets, quickly counting them. You know, you can look, look quickly at a profit and loss statement and see what's going on in a unit, right, in division. You might have expert intuition by now working for your email and seeing if there's a subject line for an email, you can tell 99 times out of 100 whether it's spam or useful. Because again, in both of those cases, you had an ability to quickly get feedback on that area. When you click on it, you get feedback, right? Or when on the spreadsheet, you look at it in more depth and you see, okay, here's what's going on. So you need to think about where you have expert intuition. And we, in many areas where it feels like we have expert intuition, like let's say hiring people, evaluating people, we really don't <laughs> because we don't do those things very often. I mean, how long does it take to figure out whether someone is a good hire, talking about hiring someone? It takes a, it takes a while. <laughs> And you don't repeat that and you get, don't get good feedback on your interactions, right? So those are the kinds of things you want to be thinking about. Where do you have expert intuition and where do you not have expert intuition? So I want you to take 30 seconds now and think about areas where you might feel that you have expert intuition, but you don't have as much expert intuition as it might intuitively feel that you do. So please go ahead, write down those areas. Where it feels like you have expert intuition, but you might not have as much expert intuition as it feels like you have. All right, let's go on. So the danger here, the specific danger, the specific ways that our mind is miswired are called cognitive biases. This is a term, a broad category, for things like the halo effect, the horns effect, we'll talk about a couple of other examples, of situations where our mind just goes astray. It makes bad decisions. And this is the concept that you really want to be aware of. These cognitive biases really impede our effective engagement with employees, with clients, this is a serious problem. Now, let's talk about another couple of cognitive biases. So take a look at this. And let's tell me what you see here. How many see an older woman in this picture? Please go ahead and raise your hands. OK, good, lower your hands. How many see a younger woman in this picture? Okay. Good, lower your hands. Okay, so this is a picture of both a younger woman and an older woman. So it's one of those visual illusions. You've probably heard about them. So the one on the right is showing more of where the older woman is. So the older woman is looking out that way. She has a wart on her nose. You could see that oh, she has an, the, there's her eye, there's her nose, there's her chin. And the younger woman is looking out that way. So you could see that her nose is, where her cheek is, her neck, and her ear. Now, raise your hand if you see both women. Okay, not quite everyone. So if you don't see both women, ask someone at the table to show you and explain to you. No, I, I am serious. There are plenty of people who don't see these. Yeah, please go ahead. There are plenty of people who don't see this even after seeing this picture. It takes a while. And so depending on which you saw first, you might have a tendency to be an optimist or a pessimist. 
Generally, people who are more optimistic see the younger woman first. Those who are more pessimistic see the older woman first, but not a guarantee. So the optimism bias. All right, let's go on. So the optimism bias, what's that about? It has to do with people who see the grass as green on the other side of the hill, people who see the glass as half full. They have a lot of strengths. They're innovative, creative, entrepreneurial, cheerleaders, motivators, visionary, entrepreneurial. So these are people who are very creative. Now, I, and this is, by the way, not a binary, optimism, pessimism. This is kind of a range. We go for, from extremely optimistic to moderate to strongly optimistic, moderately optimistic, then moderately pessimistic, strongly pessimistic, and extremely pessimistic. Now, I tend to be strongly optimistic. That means I tend to be, you know, I wake up in the morning and I have 20 ideas and it feels like they're all brilliant. <laughs> That's kind of how optimists feel. Unfortunately, we have some problems. We tend to pursue shiny new objects too much and we tend to be risk blind. So that's a problem for us. Now, pessimists, on the other hand, are the opposite. They see the glass as half empty. They see the grass as yellow on the other side of the hill. So they have a lot of strengths. They're great at improving things, at fixing and maintaining. They're great at being controllers, implementers, devil's advocates, managers. They have a lot of strengths. But of course, they have some weaknesses. So they tend to have risk aversion and stagnation. So these can be really serious challenges for pessimists. Or if you prefer to not use pessimist, then you're a realist. <laughs> so if you take, if, seriously, if you call yourself a realist, you're a pessimist, you just <laughs> don't want to acknowledge that. <laughs> there is a, so pessimism is the scientific term. I use the terms that you can look up Google and look up the stuff on Wikipedia and whatnot. And uh, you'll get a copy of my book about this also, so you can look that up there. But it acquired a pejorative connotation, unfortunately, in the modern world. So people tend to use realists for themselves if they're pessimistic. But if you use that, <laughs> you tend to be pessimistic. Now, the thing about optimists and pessimists is that you need to learn how to work together effectively with people who are, if you're optimistic, with people who are pessimistic, if you're pessimistic or realistic, with people who are optimistic. And it can be a challenge because people who are optimistic, they tend to see people who are pessimistic or realistic as being Mr. No or Mrs. No. And the people who are pessimistic tend to see people who are optimistic as Mr. or Mrs. Shoot from the hip. So that is a serious challenge. And you need to know how to deal with these challenges because I see a lot of just conflicts and fighting. And I remember that in my own life. So I said, I'm optimistic. and when I met my wife, who my girlfriend at the time, she is strongly pessimistic. So it was a big challenge for us early on in the relationship, for example, in many areas. But one area is in surprises. I love surprises, so I really enjoy surprises. And she really does not like surprises. <laughs> she feels anxious about surprises. But it was very hard for me to realize that early on in the relationship, I kept surprising her, and I thought that, oh, I gave her the wrong surprise. I needed to try something different. I need to try another surprise, another surprise. You know, <laughs> that's how it feels to optimists. We tend to feel frustrated and confused when pessimists don't react in a positive way to new things and innovative things and creative things. People who are pessimistic or realistic tend to respond with anxiety. With, they feel anxious, they feel worried about harebrained ideas from optimists like us. <laughs> and so you need to understand, and this is about social intelligence, empathize and understand the emotions of people who are different than you. Because those people are going to have those emotions and they're not going to react positively. So that's why it's really important to have at least two of people on your team for balance. Optimists are great for innovation, motivation, and vision. You need pessimists for improvement, skepticism, and implementation. So you need two of each on your team, at least two of each on your team. And you'll have a lot of trouble if you don't. You'll have one of these missing, you'll have not be innovative and creative and motivated enough if you don't have optimists, and you will not have enough skepticism and improvement implementation if you don't have pessimists. Now, I have a six-people consulting company on employee engagement, future work stuff, and if I only hired other optimists, well, th they would have 20 ideas before breakfast, and we'd be reinforcing each other's ideas. So with six people, 120 ideas, we'd be just running in 120 different directions. And that's how the company would go bankrupt. <laughs> Not a good idea. So 
while I love working with other optimists, I really click with them, I make sure to hire pessimists as well. And I give my 20 brilliant ideas to these pessimists, and they say, well, these are all half-baked ideas, but maybe these three are worth finishing baking. And so then they work on those ideas, and then they finish baking those half-baked potatoes, and then they improve them, and they implement them, and they're great. But it's hard for them to come up with ideas because they see the intuitive flaws and problems associated with each idea. So the way that optimists and pessimists need to work together is that optimists need to learn to be the ones generating the ideas. That's great. But then they need to pass over their ideas and the ownership of their ideas to pessimists. Not hold on to their ideas and defend their ideas, but give the ideas over to pessimists and then have the pessimists evaluate the ideas and manage the ideas and implement the ones that they seem as best. So there needs to be a division in innovation and creativity in the process, not the typical brainstorming where everyone does everything together. So that's how you work really well together. And that's why you need two, at least two of each on your team, because if you have only one pessimist, she or he will tend to be dominated by the optimists. Same thing with the optimists will be shut down by the pessimists. So let's take 30 seconds and write down where optimism and pessimism might be a challenge for your organization. Please go ahead, take 30 seconds and write that down. All right, let's go on. Now, we're gonna watch a video, and the goal of the video for you will be to count the number of times that the players playing white pass the ball. The monkey business illusion. Count how many times the players wearing white pass the ball. The correct Not answer right. is 16 passes. Okay, good. Did you spot the gorilla? For people who haven't seen or heard about a video like this before, about half missed the gorilla. If you knew about the gorilla, yes. you probably saw it. But did you notice the curtain changing color or the player on the black team leaving the game? Let's rewind and watch it again. Here comes the gorilla, and there goes a player, and the curtain is changing from red to gold. When you're looking for a gorilla, you often miss other unexpected events. And that's the monkey business illusion. Learn more about this illusion. So where's your attention? Let's talk about that. How many people saw the gorilla? Okay, so I think about a third of you didn't see the gorilla. Okay, cool. How many people saw the gorilla and the player leaving the game? Something like maybe 20% of you. 
How about the gorilla uh, and the curtain changing color? Okay, something like maybe seven, eight percent of you. How many people saw all elements? Okay, something like four or five people. Cool, maybe four or five percent. Great. Okay. How many got sixteen? How many got sixteen while doing that? <laughs> all right. So this has to do with the attentional bias. It's one of these cognitive biases, these dangerous judgment errors, where we focus on what's most emotionally salient. We focus on what feels most important to us. So let's say you're performing an audit of a company. It might feel very important to focus on whatever is the most salient, whatever is pointed out to you as the most important thing to focus on, but there might be other elements that might be really important that are going to be hard to notice because focusing on loud criticism, for example, rather than employees quite quitting or client disengagement is something that leads to client disengagement <laughs> when you're doing an audit <laughs> or employee disengagement. So when you're focusing on the bottom line, when you're focusing on numbers, obviously it's very important for you, it's very easy to miss disengagement, client disengagement, people leaving the game. It's very easy to miss the context, the culture deteriorating. You know, I work a lot on returning to the office and hybrid and work and flexible work. One of the challenges with the return to the office is that it's easy to miss how people changed their mindsets, their values. There was a recent article out, research paper from the Federal Bank of St. Louis that found that people are actually working less time than they used to. There's a higher workforce participation, but people are spending less time working, especially educated men. Educated males are spending less time working than they did before the pandemic, and that shows a clear shift toward valuing work-life balance, valuing flexibility, thinking about culture issues. This is really important to understand what's going on with engagement. And there are certain implications there. So you need to really be aware of how people change. That's kind of the background context. That's the curtain changing color. If you try to work in this new world, thinking that it's the same as the old world, that the background context didn't change, that's not going to be good for your employee engagement or for your client engagement. Lots of clients, for example, who some accounting firms I work with, they prefer to spend more time working remotely. So talking about remote work, engaging remotely, it feels like it's important for you to go out and meet them in person, but maybe the client doesn't want to do that. <laughs> so thinking about all of these things, what does client engagement look like? What does employee engagement look like? It's very easy for us to miss this. So the attentional bias is a quite dangerous tendency, and it's one of the important cognitive biases for you to be aware of. So I want you to take 30 seconds right now and write down where the attentional bias might be a problem for you, for your company. So please go ahead, write down where it might be a problem for you. All right, so right now what I'd like you to do is turn to the other people at your table or to the other pe to the people behind you, if you're, not, if you're alone at the table, and share the most important insight that you had from the writing down that you did over this time. Share and get feedback from them on these important insights. So let's take five minutes and have that discussion. 
So you've all taken some time to write things down. What is the most important insight that you've gained over this period of these cognitive biases? Five minutes. I'm going to walk around, flag me down if you have any questions. Sure. All right, everyone. All right, great discussions, which you can continue in the break after the presentation. There will be a nice hors d'oeuvres served. So at this point, I'd like 
people who have some insights, uh, one insight that they would like to share, and you'll get a microphone from Oliver. So, who would like to share any insights? There were excellent discussions. Yes, hold on for a second. I was just going to say, we noticed that we can sometimes move from optimism to pessimism role, mm -hmm. depending on who the other person or group that we're with. Mm -hmm. So like somebody that's extremely optimistic, I might move into more of a pessimistic mm -hmm. role or nature and play more of devil's advocate and vice versa. So mm -hmm. that was one thing. Excellent. Thank you. Yes. Yeah, so there's you're going to be predisposed towards some optimistic or pessimistic you can work on expressing a different persona some people can some people can't especially if they're extremely optimistic or extremely pessimistic but yes if you're more moderately optimistic moderately pessimistic you can express more of the other persona so it's important for you to be thinking about that ideally you'd have two of each on your team but you need to express that <laughs> sometimes that's helpful excellent thank you who else what? <laughs> um, so I think there was a lot of things from framing perspective that yes. were that were really powerful. Uh, one of the things about intent, attentional bias mm -hmm. is the idea of organizational goals and tone at the top and the things that mm. you set in order to make sure that the thing is actually that is most valuable to you and the team is what's being expressed. Yeah. Um, so I do I do see that a lot go mm. haywire when it comes to what are we pushing down from the top to mm -hmm. give people to pay attention to mm -hmm. and what are we not and is that really the direction we want to be going? That's an excellent insight and it's often the case that leaders don't realize what kind of behaviors they're modeling. They might be saying one thing, but they might be modeling a different behavior. So that it's not simply going to be what you're saying, but it's also what you're showing. And so it's going to be another example of attentional bias that's related to what you're discussing. Okay, one more person. One person wants to share? Would you have something you want to share? I was trying to encourage her to. <laughs> <laughs> he is a professor. Okay, well, 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 let's wait for the microphone. Okay. So, the horns effect, the horns effect, and a halo effect. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, at work, if you like somebody, almost everybody, everything that person does is right, you know. <laughs> or if you don't like somebody, you know, this person, mm -hmm. everything that person does is wrong. Mm -hmm. You just don't like that person. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yes. It's, it's very tem tempting. It's very intuitive. It's good that you realize that. Yes, absolutely. So it's really important for us to realize that's exactly the tendency that you're describing, right? The horns effect surrounds that person, that person has horns, halo effect, same thing. Really something to watch out for. Excellent. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Let's not have horns effect story. <laughs> Let's move on to the second part of the presentation. How do you notice and address these cognitive biases? The first thing is that you need to care about them. You need to care about noticing that, hey, you don't like that person, and that will give you a horns effect toward that person as a whole, or you like that person. We tend to have difficulty realizing that emotions are going to be at the forefront here. Just knowing about these cognitive biases is really not going to be enough. That's why I, talk, that's why I took pauses. I gave you time to write down where it might be a problem for you. Because if you don't realize and appreciate where it's a problem for you, you're not going to care. And if you don't care, despite your knowledge, you're not really going to do much about it if you don't care about it. So you need to care about it. You really need to care in order to make the decision. The large majority of our behaviors come from how we feel, not how we think. Now, we're accountants here. It might seem like we're rational people, but it's, we're not really nearly as rational as it might seem we are. <laughs> the large majority of everyone's behaviors comes from emotions, not from their thoughts. So when we just do what comes naturally to us, and which is what we do all the time, unless we're very deliberate in catching and understanding these problems. 
And so to address cognitive biases, we need to identify where we fall into these mistakes, recognize the pain caused by them, and take research-based steps to address them. So feeling the emotions, that's why I talked about emotional intelligence early on, where you need to feel and appreciate and be care and be concerned about addressing these problems and not making these mistakes. Now, there are going to be two tools I'll share with you, and I'll send them to you, everyone, after the presentation, so you'll have them. One is going to be an assessment on these dangerous judgment errors. That will help you understand where they are. It looks at the 30 most dangerous judgment errors in the workplace. Now, if you look at Wikipedia on these cognitive biases, you'll see a list of over 100 of them. Not all of them are going to be relevant to the workplace, but you can take a look at the list of Wikipedia. This assessment that you'll get takes a look at the 30 most dangerous ones in the workplace, how often they occur in the last year, and helps you evaluate their impact on your company and next steps to address these problems. So it's very useful for you to assess, to take the assessment yourself and then get your team to do so, to recognize and address these dangerous judgment errors, to recognize and care about them. So let's take a look at some examples of these sample questions. When a potential or current employee was evaluated, in what percentage of the situations over the last year was the evaluation too negative or too positive due to factors not relevant to their job competency or organizational fit? So please go ahead, write down the percentage right now of this. In what percentage of the situation was the evaluation either too negative or too positive? So it wasn't the right evaluation due to factors not relevant to their job competency or organizational fit. So write down your percentage. Let's go on the second one. Of all times when someone claimed credit for themselves in a team project, in what percentage of the cases did they claim more credit than they deserved? And finally, of all times when someone was evaluating a situation and making a decision, in what percentage of the cases did they underestimate the intensity of feelings of other stakeholders? Okay, so the first one has to do with the halo effect and the horns effect, which you already know about. The second one is called illusory superiority. So we tend to feel, perceive ourselves as superior to others. There's a lot of research showing that if you ask the members of a team how much credit out of 100% you should get for the completion of a project, the final score that it's added up is going to be 200% <laughs> or close to that. And the final one, that's going to be the empathy gap. So we tend to not really appreciate the importance of other people's emotions, how important those emotions are. We tend to perceive other people as more rational than they are. So that's the empathy gap. Now, at this point, I'd like you to turn to the other people at your table and share your scores with them and get their feedback on those scores. So talk about that and see which of these challenges might be the most problematic for your company. So we'll take three minutes for this brief exercise.
All right, everyone. So I said this would be a shorter exercise. Again, we'll have after this, there'll be a chance to discuss this, have some hors d'oeuvres. So does anyone want to share an insight they had from doing this exercise, from discussing it with others? He may call on you. He's a professor. <laughs> I might, but I want to see if anyone would like to share about anything they realized. Yes, please. So, just in our conversations and comparing our notes, we had wildly different, not wildly yep. different, but quite different answers mm -hmm. and decided it was based on our own personal experiences, like mm -hmm. in the outcomes from interviews or yep. team projects or whatever that that gave us a different perception mm -hmm. um, from each other's experiences. So. Absolutely. So what you'll tend to find is that that's why I suggest you do it yourself, but you also have your team do it because each of you, it's kind of like blind men figuring out different parts of an elephant, right? you're going to see different experiences, different aspects of the company, what's going on in the situation. And it'll be really valuable for you to get each other's feedback on why you have those different perspectives. On um, Again, within your company, right now you're talking to people, some of them in your company, some of them from outside your company, getting their feedback. And you'll have wildly different numbers. And the crucial thing is in explaining and discussing why you put that answer. Because that gives you the underlying challenges and opportunities to, of the problems that you'll want to address. Anyone else wants to share? On the first item, I actually put 50%, mm -hmm. and I was thinking of one person in particular yep. that uh, quality of work can definitely lack, but mm. I like the person so much. Yeah. Talk about that halo. Yeah, yeah. So nice, so caring, mm -hmm. so you know, generous and emotional that you don't want to be offensive and actually give the whole truth. And that's yeah. a disservice, but it's also trying to be empathetic and mm -hmm. trying to care. So it's, yeah. it's a tough balance. It really is a tough balance. And if you don't give that person the truth, they will never improve, right? So it's kind of like, how do you... The short term, it's good for you and good for them, but long term, it's bad for you and bad for them. <laughs> it's a tough balance, and I can really empathize with what you're struggling with. But yes, that's a definitely a great example of that, and I'm sure other people can relate. All right, so the assessment is one tool. Let me share with you about another tool that you can use. So avoiding employee and client engagement disasters. So this, the assessment is for you to know about these. But how do you solve them? Well, an ounce of prevention is really worth a pound of cure. It's a great quote from Ben Franklin. And I want to share with you about a way that you can address a number of these cognitive biases at once through five key questions to avoid decision disasters. So this is a technique that you can use in any decision that you don't want to screw up, you know, make five or 10 decisions. If you're writing an important email to a client, figuring out how to have a challenging conversation, making a decision about a purchase, anything that you don't want to screw up. So thinking about that or making an assessment of a company's financial future, five key questions to avoid decision disasters. The first question is, what important information did I not yet fully consider? Now, we tend to not consider information that goes against our intuition, that goes against our beliefs. Whenever you're trying to make a decision, it's kind of like make a business case for it. You're trying to find evidence in support of it. That's great if you want to try to convince someone, but it's not great to make the right decision. What you really want to try to do is disconfirm your intuitions. Try to prove yourself wrong. Look at information that doesn't conform to your beliefs and weigh that more heavily, twice as heavily. That's kind of one aspect of this question. The other one is what information is important. You don't want to be stuck in analysis paralysis. And so you want to think about what information is going to be important versus what information is not going to be really important for influencing your decision. So you don't get stuck in that analysis paralysis. Two, what are the dangerous judgment errors have I not yet addressed? So if you're thinking about a person who you like, for example, it might be a halo effect, or if you're thinking about a project in which you're involved and you're thinking about the roles of different people that might be illusory superiority 
or not realizing why somebody makes the decisions because of their emotions. There might be an empathy gap. So thinking about all of these dynamics is important. What would a trusted and objective advisor suggest I do? So someone who, let's say, is your peer here in the room who you like and who you trust, someone who's a coach or a mentor in your company, an advisor, thinking about what they would tell you to do in this situation is going to be quite helpful. So these three questions are really to make the decision. But if you don't implement the decision well, you are not going to have the right outcome. So the last two questions are for implementation. How have I addressed all the ways this could fail? So thinking about the decision and how it can fail can be incredibly helpful for you to make a better decision in the situation. Because if you can decide all the ways it could fail, it's called a pre-mortem, then you can fix all these problems in advance. And finally, what new information would cause me to revisit this decision? What would cause you to change your mind about a decision? We tend to be stuck after we make a decision. It's called post-factum rationalization. But if we decide in advance, that, hey, this new information caused me to change my mind, then we're going to be much less stuck and we'll be able to change our decision. Let's walk through this. Let's say you're making a new hire. So it's a frequent decision. So you're making a new hire. What new information would cause me to what uh, information that I not yet fully consider. One thing I see a lot of accountants do that they don't fully consider is ask, actually calling and checking references for a new hire. It can be challenging and you feel like, oh, okay, I went through all the steps, I don't need to call the references. But I've seen when you actually call references, you know, some references will just give a very anodyne, kind of very brief description that doesn't really share their enthusiasm for the person. Or maybe you can ask, what kind of a culture would this person be a good fit for? And of course, there are different cultures, and they might describe a culture that's really different from your culture. So that's an example. Then, what, new, what dangerous judgment errors haven't you yet considered? So what haven't you taken into account? So these dangerous judgment errors, for example, if you like this person, you might have a halo effect, or if you have some, you know, have an accent or something, they're coming from somewhere that's different, you might have a horns effect. Next, what would a trusted advisor suggest I do in this situation? So talk to someone who hasn't been involved in the interview process, give them your feedback on this person, and get that person's feedback. How have I addressed the ways this could fail? Many ways I see a new hire failing is that they don't fit into the culture quickly enough. So you can get this person a mentor or two mentors who would help them fit into the culture of the organization. So that's a way to address failure. And finally, what new information would cause me to change my mind? So you can have at the 30, 60, and 90 day mark, you can have 360 degree interviews with the five people who are closest to this person, interact with them all the time. And that would give you a chance at the 30, 60, and 90 day mark to change the way this person is integrating into the organization if they're not doing so well, and then finally make a decision at the 90 day mark. So that's an example of how you would work for these five questions. Now, let's take uh, 30 seconds and think about, oh, we have a bit more time. Let's take two minutes and talk to the people at your table about ways that you can integrate these questions into your everyday decision making and to help yourself and help your team make good decisions as well. Because this is great for team decision making. You can have everyone answer the questions on a team decision making, like someone hiring or something changing a process before you come to a meeting, and then just have everyone read their answers when they come to a meeting so that you're not anchored by each other. That's very helpful. And then you'll have a much quicker decision making process than a typical decision making meeting. So take two minutes to discuss where these questions might be useful for you.
All right, folks. So I said this would be a shorter exercise. Let's finish up. Now, which of these questions do you think would be most useful for you to use? Which of these questions resonated most of you? Which of these questions feels most relevant in making your decisions? Okay, over there. Three. Oh, over there, there's the microphone. Number three. Okay, explain why. Because lots of times we get into a bubble, we get to thinking things uh, in the trees, we look, kind of think things just one way. <laughs> we have other inputs to give different uh, a direction or a little bit different perspectives. That will round it out more so that we get more of an educated uh, approach. Excellent. And that's definitely getting an external perspective is one of the really effective. So all of these are specific ways of addressing a number of cognitive biases. Getting an external perspective is a very useful way of doing so. Excellent. Thank you. Anybody else? Do you have anyone has a different opinion than number three? I'm just going to keep talking. Yes. Okay, so <laughs> I think we were, all of them are important and exciting, but I sure. think number five for us was one okay. of the ones that we, we highlighted the most, mm -hmm. primarily because you can make an initial decision, yeah. but if you don't have the fail safes or the reevaluation mm -hmm. period, yeah. you may allow a decision that is not good any longer to remain. Mm -hmm. so. Excellent. That, that's a really important insight. So having those fail safes in place is very valuable. Great. Anyone else wants to share one more? Oh, well, let's get the microphone so everyone can hear you. Okay, so an uncomfortable question, I think, in the CPA world is client in, client engagement or ending a client engagement. You know, yep. uh, we're trying to grow our firms, we're trying to take care of our families, we're trying to be profitable, and and uh, sometimes there there's business that's not worth dealing with. Yeah. And so, it, it, I mean, the the engagement disaster could be keeping the client Absolutely. as opposed to disengaging and and going a different direction. Absolutely. And, and because that that could the ripple effects of keeping a client that is, you know, a challenge for for the company is mm -hmm. also a challenge on the employees as well. That's excellent insight. And that really relates to number four very well. What ways can this fail? So when you're thinking about going through a client engagement and thinking about, OK, what are the red flags? Have you established policies and have you that are red flags? for ways that disengagement might be a real failure. And if you establish those in advance, that can be very helpful. Thank you. OK, did, did, you, have, did, you, did you want to share something? Yes, OK, one last one. Mm -hmm. uh, for me, I was looking at what important information did I not yet fully consider. Mm -hmm. And maybe being a CPA, I'm yep. really looking at the numbers a yep. lot. And the non-financial numbers is something that I maybe haven't considered enough. Mm. OK, that's excellent. And that's why this presentation is on engagement, employee engagement and client engagement, definitely. Thank you. Excellent. Did you, have, did you want to share something? OK, cool. Let's go ahead and finish out. So now you have the techniques that you need. The techniques that you need to the behavioral science tools to make the best decisions. And so that's the key here. You want to have the tools and you want to care about using them. So caring is incredibly important. We don't evaluate caring nearly enough. So you'll improve engagement for the sake of high optimal returns and competitive advantage, as did Bruce Zakari of the Bernadio Group. So again, they got to be the top 50 because they valued and cared about culture. So defeating cognitive biases. We've talked about a number of them. Halen Horn's effect, optimism and pessimism bias, attentional bias. We talked about the illusory superiority effect, the empathy gap, and a number of others. So best practices for doing so. Take the assessment and with your team to learn about and address these cognitive biases. Care about them. You need to care about them. Use the five key questions to make the best decisions. We talked about a number of questions. There are, all of them are going to be useful in some way or other. There's much more information in my book. You'll get a copy of it. I'm not trying to sell it here. <laughs> I'll send digital copies to everyone after the talk. So I'll be happy to do a complimentary coaching meeting with anyone. Just approach me after the presentation on integrating this information into your company. Now go out and help your team become leaders in employee and client engagement. You can do as well as Bruce Zakari did of the Bernardio Group or even better. Thank you very much.